Hey everybody, this is Tevo DRC and we're here for Tevo Creative Leadership and the DFW Leader Ministry Fellowship online. And we are here today, Dr. T, to get you ready for what we're about to do. God wants us to get some body unity, Christian body unity, teach diversity, have our teammate university, which is going to be not under the law, defragging accusation, making calling born again ministry to be more diverse, less dogmatic, not PC, not people pleasing, but to be convicting yet under the anointing governed and self-government. I'm not under covering. That is a giant doctrine and teaching out in charismatica, mostly white that are raised in the country and were maybe raised raw. I don't know under legalism, but I am not. And I'm a teacher and a trainer for many generations and so I have my doctrines and my uh, honorary doctorate but it's in sacred music but I'm doing it because the Lord has called me to when I was 23 after being raised a pastor's cherished firstborn beloved daughter he was a pastor, a Baptist minister, very non-racist, very loving. My mother was a capable, strong woman and a wonderful lady, but he was the head of the home. And so I witnessed on and off stage real leadership, office ministry. And I realized it could be just as humble and servant leader and smart and funny and wise and family as you want it to be. And I remember going out with my dad to the store and watching him relate, watching him equally relate, whether they were high or low in a state, black or white, men or women, he always acted like Jesus. And so what we're going to teach our basic our basic viewpoint, our charismatic, I'm not a charismatic, that's where these doctrines are, a lot of these shepherding is not me, <laughs> but what we've done is, when I was 24, after being raised and, you know, valued and respected, not under the law as a woman or as a person, but valued as a person, human first, I got that in my spirit, I thought that's how a Christian is, a real Christian, I had not any clue about the legalism, the religious spirit, all the traditions of men going back from way back to, you know, blaming Eve, blaming onto Eve and f about her sin. And I've studied that like a noble Berean should. I've, f I've run into matriarchism, patriarchism, Western European matriarch, Paker have been the nightmare personally of this move of God. I call this the abiding relationship theology move of the Lord. And it's to train people how not to be under the law and yet still not compromise and still be convicting, but to train how to have humility and diversity and put relationships over legalism. So when I'm going to teach, I'm going to have to say heads up to the whelp. My friends, the Christians who are in that false teaching of legalism, of covering and Levitical patriarchism. Back in Dallas, where I was faced with it at every turn, big and micro in ministry and mega in ministry all the time, I really thought, wow, there for the grace of God go I. Let me examine what's in their doctrinal bath waters and who does it and what is their style. So we found that was... <laughs> primarily charismatic, spirit-filled. So I dropped out. The lead, God took me out of being a charismatic because I'm not going to be under cult-following, patriarch, you know, perceiver, sin-spying, Jezebel, all this accusing doctrine. And it makes friendly fire fellowships. And it detracts. It disrespects so that people don't want to go. They don't feel safe going to some of these tough customers, houses of the Lord. That's why you see me sparking out on all this teaching about Phariseeism. So I'm going to give you a heads up that I'm going to be out there in the field, the pioneer apostle, the chief apostle of the work, which this one is, clears the land. So I have to clear the land. There are that many hundreds and multiplied thousands of the assertive and aggressive, backbiting and undermining whelp. And so I'm giving you a heads up. I'm not going to be against you, but I'm not. You can talk about me all you want to, but I'm going to forgive you, but teach correct doctrine. I'm going to teach reproving. I'm going to teach submitted selahs, giving you from Eli, the temple I priesthood of Samuel that brought about Ichabod, that abused wine, women, and song, and money. 
collections. I'm going to teach the frost, the you know, lost love, first love lamp stand, which is the similar in the New Testament, Revelation 2, because it's about the key thing, relationships. A lack of first love, real respect for the relationship with the Lord in ministry. And you got to teach it now. Then that trickles down to the staff and they diminish. They're immune to correction. They don't really care or respect relationships that God sends to them, certain kinds, and they practice maybe typecasting respecter of persons. And once you have a respecter of persons spirit, which is mentioned in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you are actually Pharisees who are projecting rejection and accusation on the people that are not in your in crowd. So you can't have pets. You're going to want to have pets, and you can have some that have favor and that you can trust. That's a difference. But then you got to be careful because God says, do not mingle faith with the respecter of person's spirit. Plus that suspicious typecasting. Oh, my heavens. Jezebel spying on newbies. I've, I have so many tales to tell, and they're true. <laughs> it stirred me up because I'm Luke. One of the Luke eyewitnesses because, let me say this, I sort of skip that part. When I was raised as a calm, well brought up, mostly traditional, but yet not not bound by legalism, a free thinking Baptist, really a Christian more than a Baptist, by my parents and grandparents and extended family, males and females, who were white, but not bigoted, not Levitical patriarchs or matriarchs, none of them. Then I could, it helped me discern when I was getting <laughs> criticized as a female, or put down, diminished, uh, controlled, all these things, because I was raised the opposite. So instead of me being needing to be liberated, like I get the LP accused, or, you know, sometimes she needs to be, she's, she's a women's liber. No, I was brought up liberated. I'm trying to liberate you, the Levitical patriarchs, matriarchs, the we centrics who are bound. And so we're going to get into dialogue and dissecting and vocabulary def definitions like we centric we are the world colonial which I'm not and then there's white people that is we, we Western European background which are we global tribal more diverse which is me many things but when I was raised not rough not raw but skill by you know needing to know truth trying to search out don't be fooled from youth on I was a Jesus person accepted Christ on my own went out to college after I got you know went to college got the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in the tongues didn't know what to do with it at the time but then later I found it's really wonderful but I'm not a dogmatist you don't have to do it I won't put you down if you don't but you should try it's really fun it's revelation enhancing it's a, a blessing a gift anyway so I was there and then following college when I was before children came along I was married and so we were at a half charismatic half Presbyterian church just because it was a balance between that we felt was right at that time. Not that it was Presbyterian, it was just like more traditional and then the charismatic was new. So one day when I was there, they really had great teaching and the holy fear of the Lord. It was a main thing, major thing. So when I was sitting there at about 1976, I felt the Lord say, I want you to study my body, the different kinds of Christians, black and white, all colors that believe the Bible that are truly born again and I'm going to send you and I want you to study their pet peeves, their doctrine, their dress, their red flag buzzwords, all the things, their music and one day I'm going to have you build bridges to build bridges between the parts of my body. I had no clue what that meant. That was 40 some years ago and God has protected me and kept me safe and spared me but also preserved me from some of the amazing things you learn on the way and a lot of it has been a great, I guess you say, a pilgrim in the progress. Just walking it out, one day in, one day out, not knowing, not having an agenda except to hear God and do what he said that day, that week, that year, that month, like you, like my, a lot of you. So it was one day in, one day out. And then back in Dallas, <laughs> I've only met one other person, to my knowledge, maybe two. But I met this female in Carrollton one time. She applied for a job for me. 
And she was led the same way. And she had seen things that were unusual, a bit hairy, but her demeanor was like mine, not a critic, not suspicious, not looking for trouble, not trouble finds if I'm going to have trouble. And, do, and God is going to allow me to have a heads up that there needs to be a doctrinal correction, an addressing, a reproof, a uh, defragging of legalism because it brings accusation. Levitical law, Levitical critical in New Testament times brings accusation. If it's racist, biased, jaundiced, sh gender biased, compassion fatigued, Eli Tai priesthood, and I see it more than three times, that's the word theft, licentiousness, anything like that, vulture culture at the grassroots, at the bottom ranks. If I see it by just being led of the Lord, not looking for it, but I go to somewhere and it shows up and finds me and it happens once or twice, the Lord said, ignore it. If you see it three or more times, teach on it because you're seeing only a little bit what I see a lot of and that's why I'm doing this. This is why we're doing it for Jesus' name, for his good name, his safe name, to say, let's go back and find organic, organic Christ following New Testament, first church born again. All right. Then we have to say who and what is organic. That means without any human synthetic additives. You have to look at everybody's teaching, including mine. I give you, we give you permission to check out our doctrine because Apostle Paul did. Apostle Paul's my hero. He said, work out your own salvation. This is part of it. It's a command to you on your own before the Lord, maybe asking others help and opinion. Nothing wrong with that. But you got to work out your own salvation. Paul commended the noble Berean Jews. He called them noble because they picked apart his teaching, his apostolic first church teaching, to see if it really lined up with the Torah, the scriptures of the time. So I believe in that. You can pick apart my doctrine. I'll pick apart yours. And then we get along. And then with James 3.17, our criteria, abiding James 3.17 relationship theology. All right, that's our teaching. How do we know who and what is being taught is back under the law. Why? The law accuses. It keeps watching everybody, keeping tabs. It judges falsely. It spreads lies. It snaps at people, jumps people in public, which I've had happen <laughs> in my wildest times. So Ode to Whelp at the top of onlinefellowship.us, Ode to Whelp, that is a testimony of what I, myself, and many, many others have been through over decades, not all at once, thank God. That's why I'm joyful with the Lord, not a part of a lot of this Whelp stuff. You can have a lot of good things, positive to say about charismatics, a lot of them, really good stuff. But if you get into the sect of whelp, if you get into the false teaching that causes Phariseeism, they withstand you, they won't relate, they will talk about you and talk against you, but never talk to you, which is my bone to pick. It's my big bone, the lack of respect, um, really lack of respect. So it made me just research their doctrine, and it's taken over 30 years when I was sent after many happy decades, even in my own ministry, before this doctrine surfaced, Phariseeism, Western European Levitical Patriarchism is my term. My due term, it means shepherding, overseer shepherding. I am going to break it down of what it is that was, that I believe puts it in a false teaching within maybe some true, good, Holy Spirit teachings and, the, and great worship that's therapeutic, really wonderful worship. So my bottom line, don't accuse these people. Don't accuse me. I won't accuse you, but you assess me and then you have to think, if I have learned that there is X amount percentage of false teaching in a prophet, a pastor, a ministry, a group, a church, a fellowship, a movement, how much do I tolerate? How much would God want me to be there? And when should I say, uh-uh, I better get out. 
they're a false prophet, a false movement, a false, and that's what I'm leaving, submitting to you as the noble Berean in your own heart to determine. I do not lightly call anyone in this day alive a false teacher or prophet unless they are really already out there teaching that you you know there's more than one way to heaven that type of thing but within the group that believe that Christ is the only way there is a lot a lot of ministry false teaching yet I am not going to be a and a character assassinator like they are <laughs> I will not name them in public. I will not jump them in public. I will not be rude like these are. However, I will reprove, as is my office call, Galatians 1, 1 and 6. 1 through, excuse me, Galatians 1, 1 and 2. The call is over this person, over this house, this teaching center, this non-legalistic teaching center of doctrine is Galatians 1, 1 and 2 like Paul. It says, I, Paul, an apostle, an office apostle, birthing a trail, commissioned to do a work for the Lord. That's an apostle. Servant leadership is our style. All right. Paul, an apostle, sent out not by any one group or any one person. I and the brothers that are with me. That's me. All right. Tavo. Christian Tavo called by God, commissioned by God, not sent out by any one group, not any one man or female or, or person, I and the brothers and sisters that are with me online and also on land. And we are pioneering our ministry with our office, getting ready to have meetups and groups and gatherings. If that is what we want right now, I'm going to do counseling and training in our teammate university. And we take volunteers and we are looking for what God wants because we want multicolors, not just me. We're going to try to model, try to model heaven, but everyone has to know when they come, they've got to respect this person as a human and not have female issues. All right. There's some that are, you know, female issues or white issues or brown issues or free spirit issues. <laughs> critical spirits. The goal of our community feel, Ephesians 4, is our call, is to model James 3.17 in our relationships. One day in, one day out, one day in, one day out. That means that by ourselves, with God's help, we go to him because we're going to need his help. When stress comes, pressure, hell on earth, you know, like life comes, is to still resemble and model even under pressure, the wisdom that comes from above, that's pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy, even if it's hell, because you know when you're in, you get attacked. But if you fall off the horse, like everybody might, you know, me too, we just say, I'm working on me, you work on you, I'm going to get back on the horse and try to love again, just like that. So it's real respect. If you act in James 3.17 and train on it, if you really act and react like Jesus did in all his relationships, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he was a Christian work planner, an apostle's chief apostle, prophet's head office of all five offices, and we read Jesus in his relationship, he never accused, he was never biased, he was never gender biased, he was never prejudiced, he was never disrespectful, he honored his mother, he respected her as a peer, he didn't look down on, he wasn't like a religious Pharisee, a sin spire, a Jezebel watcher, you know, all these things, you know, if, there, if Jesus had ever seen a Jezebel, that's such a, it's almost like, since the 90s, I've thought this. Some groups empower a Jezebel spirit. Why? Because they put faith in their negative faith that they're going to see them, that they're going to come. Then they get all, these are usually cult type people or occult. <laughs> the witch watchers, they have a cult spirit usually, most of these. And that's why I'm not with them. <laughs> I can't stand this. All right, because they were, you know, just a lot of things. A lot of things that are not right, they're not modeling the joy of the Lord, you know, basically. So are they all bad? No, they're not evil. I'm not calling you evil. I'm not calling you wicked. I'm saying you got false teaching. 
So we're just here to help people defrag their doctrine. And if I have a doctrinal error that's not back under the law, you can fill me in in a polite James 3.17 fashion. Hey. Ephesians 5.20, Ephesians 4, talks about the common doctrine. Most people, Christians, ministers, micro and mega, have no clue about common doctrine. They're clueless. So we're going to teach it at Teammate University and on our, you know, our Maven of Doctrine site because we need to do that. So it defrags the law. All right. When Paul says, build a community, everyone walk in relationship type of unity, humility, to keep the bonds of peace, walk it out. He says there are four common doctrines that make the Christian, the hallmark of a Christian. You must be a Christian. I mean, you are a Christian only if you believe these four doctrines. You have to agree on these doctrines. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of us all. One Lord, Jesus Christ, one faith, Christian faith, one baptism, baptism for the washing of sins, as a sign for eternity and one God, the father of us all. That means if you're black or brown or green or purple or tan or light skin, mixed race, you're still, we're all related. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ and we can work things out, get over our differences with his help, with his help. So therefore, after that, we know the, we know the turf out. There are thousands of opinions on all the teachings of the law, the old Testament of Paul in the new Testament. Thou shalt, thou shalt wash their hands. Thou shalt not wear jewelry. Thou shalt, well, <laughs> thou shalt have fellowship with the saints or you're in big sin. Thou shalt Paul, all of Paul's are amazingly filled with commands. However, he's not a legalist. Because God knows that he made each one of us with our human flaws, our besetting sins, our weaknesses, our inability to do it all to show us how human we are and how big God is. So he will individually speak to you and correct you. If you really are a true Christian, you will have a relationship that he will prick your conscience. You know, I'm telling you, don't do that again. Don't eat all that. But he doesn't micromanage you, manage you. He's working on me. That's why you know, I know that. But he, if you fall even a thousand times, he'll forgive you if you're doing your best and you know it's right. So if we pick up certain things Paul has said, which are very toe curling, toe curling commands of Paul, which are, you know, get everybody all hyped up in a religious sense, then we have to say everybody, you know what? That's their choice. God's going to hold you accountable. God's going to direct them if they want to be. If he doesn't, that's their choice. But I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to be PC, but I'm going to tell you how to do it to let everybody feel respected. Everybody can have their differences. How can you keep your relationship and community in unity and diversity no matter what you disagree on without being, you know, it's your choice if you're a compromiser. I'm going to try not to be one. But I'm not going to beat you down with my Bible but because of the law and say you're no good or put you out because I disagree. Maybe you don't think a female, a white female especially, should have authority. That is your choice. Fine. I can forgive you and you can, you know, you don't have to watch. But that is okay. I can love you. I don't have to fear you, but I can say that is your choice based on Ephesians 4 common doctrine. I, however, will teach Jezebel's Adam and Eve prior to the law. Adam willfully chose. Eve was deceived. Chain of command, Ephesians 5.21 prior to 5.22. Apostle Paul said, men, keep your women silent in the church. Because he was talking probably to mostly Gentiles who were not raised under the law and had never been disciplined because they weren't educated. They're more like slaves and chattel, the women. So he says, don't let your women speak out. He didn't say all women. Why another Revelation 3, Church of Thyatira, ironically, the Jezebel, the second Jezebel story, which I've studied in great detail because of all this stuff, the law and the accuser. 
So I found out that, yes, God rebuked the lampstand leader, the head apostle pastor, overseer pastor of the church. He said, why do you tolerate that Jezebel, that dominating female Jezebel false teacher? But guess what? You have to read it quietly and carefully. He didn't rebuke Jezebel. He rebuked the pastor for tolerating and being controlled by a dominating individual who happened to be a woman named Jezebel. Now, everybody in the world has blown that into proportion at the grassroots. And now make it all women are like that. All teaching women are like that. Let's watch this. This was not Queen Jezebel. This was a person named Jezebel who was a dominating person teaching false doctrine it could have been a man in these days we're not back into the law in many churches there are women and men leaders whoever is a dominating individual you're supposed to go over there and be woman enough man enough human enough with god's help to up front confront front them and not be controlled the issue was about not letting yourself your office be controlled by anybody else man pleasing fear of man fear of woman all right However, when we read about Church of Thyatira, we realize that I thought, you know, all the legalists would say and know, oh, I thought women weren't allowed to teach in the church. Well, evidently they were because they had somebody that was allowed to teach on their ministry named Jezebel. They just happened to pick the wrong one, the wrong kind, and they were <laughs> too weak to deal with her. So we got some filling in some gaps ministry. We're going to fill in some gaps and then submit it as a sila, not dogma. Not critical of Christians, but I am upset only the fact that I've been in the grassroots, seen a lot of the relationship issues that are so disturbing, that are so friendly for our fellowship, that make people not want to go to church, and that... We've taught, had to teach. We've dealt with them. And that's why I don't like to go a lot of these places. <laughs> that's why I'm out of the Friendly Fire Fellowship. You know, Paul, he had the command. Everybody knows, especially the white ones. Paul said, don't forsake fellowshipping with the saints. Now, that type of frown is a legalistic clue. <laughs> It is your responsibility to please God and not forsake it. But he's not going to, that's not my business. If you and God, if he had, you, you know, there's a reason you want to go because I know Paul's other two commands about this. Yes. Hebrews 10 25 says, do not forsake fellowshipping with the saints, but it's not under the law. All right. You got to hear God because there are different unique situations that can really fall into the next two categories are the from such turn away commanded Pauline fellowships. All right. So you got one command that says do go. You got two commands that says don't go from such turn away. I'm trying to stir you up. I'm not trying to be mean or mad. I'm just trying to stir up the thought because it's that desert it's that thick out there it's, it's really scary for jesus sake and for the future of the church it really is all right second timothy 3 1 through 5 that from such turn away fellowship if they're accusers over and over and over and lovers of themselves me centric we're the world you know entitled all that stuff boasters accusers all those things that fit under first second timothy 3 1 through 5 it says paul says from such turn away so i have all right the second one is first timothy 6 5 if they big talkers but they say you're not blessed because you don't have a lot of money like we do from such turn away because they're respecter of person spirits religious spirits not loving it's monetary achievement so i've turned away from that too so if you would like to know more, keep on tuning in and pray for me, but also keep on tuning in to Teammate University, teammateu.com, and then we have Maven of Doctrine site, which is tclleader.com, tclleader.com, and I also bought 
mavenofdoctrines.com as well, if you want to do that one. I just thought it was a fun. So we're here for the body of Christ. We are mature. We're not superior. We're on our soapbox, however, just like Christ. When he went into the Pharisee temple, he was younger. He was the new kid on the block, so to speak, in the area where the Pharisees had set up their hornet's nest, their inquiring and achievement, legalism and law, bias and bigotry centric money making operations. And on two different occasions, not just one, not just two, but two different occasions, Jesus Christ, the young whippersnapper, at the leading of his spirit, he did it not just to be a knee jerk reactionary, but he went to the Father. He said, Lord, I'm, you know, it's grievous what's going on in your name. It's grievous what's going on in the Hebrew temple in your name. And the Father said, I want you to do this, son, on that day at this time. So, led by the Spirit, Christ went in and he tossed over the temple mammon chasers' achievement tables. And got everybody all worked up. Surely some little lady hobbled over and said, Jesus, let not your good be spoken of. And another one said in PC term, you know that Jesus, pay him no mind. He's just got bitter roots. He's got unforgiveness baggage. He doesn't know how it's going to ruin the reputation of his mother Mary. All that is PC pop psychology like we deal with right now in a lot of Christian ministry. All right. I, I've, ta I've, I've lived it. I've seen it. I've analyzed it. All right. The second time Jesus Christ rose up with zeal. This is zeal now. Nobody's used to a lot of zeal for the other than for making money, I guess, and success in business. But this is zeal for the father's house, willing to shake it up and not be popular. By God's grace, because we love Jesus and we love people that don't know Jesus. They're confused. So we're shaking it up. So the set first one was in the temple when he tossed over the mammon chasers, well-established tables, the system. The second was he went on the hillside and he wasn't PC. He didn't gossip. He didn't backbite. He openly rebuked and reprove, reproved in Matthew 23, all red letters in public before the disciples, before all the public multitudes, he rebuked openly the Pharisees. They were lovers of themselves. They were the blind guides who were so filled with their own issues, their own scribal issues that they were thinking of them making their money, keeping their money, imprisoning the people so they'd reproduce more money. So a lot of Phariseeism and accusation goes back to false teaching, but false teaching and accusation that is self-preserving goes back to money, income. So we are here. Um, a lot of people know that I've been backbitten many times, and that's why I'm so forthright. I guess I'm too forthright because I'd rather just let you know where I stand. I'm not going to bite your back. I never have. I don't believe the evil report. I believe the Lord. I believe, you know, watch out for people, but I'm really a respecter of persons. And I always have been equal opportunity. You know, you can love somebody and forgive them, but if they keep on doing it, you don't, you distance yourself. And that's why I'm teaching well, but I am putting out, the Lord has told me to draw a line in the sand this is a line in the sand after decades from 90 to now of the one kind only that has been the backbiter, never confronting, <laughs> avoiding the relations. You know, just a, the spirit in that well, false teaching, I'm coming out. You know, I went on purpose the last few years. The Lord led me to car camping, living in the hotels, but car camping and being a sign, an Ezekiel sign prior to now. I don't do that now. But it was leading me because of the sign to some of these mega ministries and micro ministries to test them, to see what they would react like, to see who they respected. And it was only the same kind, same skin color, who failed the test. You preachers, I don't know what's going on. The false teaching, the big eye, the, the 
I guess the cloud of being in celebrity, the cloud of cult following, worship cult following, the cloud of we-centric thinking. I don't know, but it is a scary thing because this is a not a this is not a patriarchal move of God only. It's an everybody move, an everyday person's move. It is not we've got the gift, nobody has it like us move. A lot of people are educated and think and that are out there being worked on by the Lord for this move of God, and they're now coming forth. I'm one, just one. So we have to think the whole, the whole Ephesians 4 community, not being biased because your last 40 years of teaching or 20 years of teaching says white, white women or, you know, Jezebels or, or black people can't do it like white people or, you know, it's only an old woman or whatever it is, or only young kid. So we have got to get past this accuser, unjust accuser, diminishing, disrespectful, and frankly, in rebellion to Jesus' nature, which is Antichrist, the Antichrist spirit in ministry. It is an Antichrist spirit in ministry. 666, flesh, flesh, flesh. All right. I'm not going to say that everybody's got it or that they don't have it. We all work on our 666, our flesh, you know what I mean? But if we can't trust the basic ministry not to be biased, the basic tongue-talking ministry, we can't trust them now to have, not have a class system in place where if you don't fit, fit their stereotype, you don't get spoken to or addressed and respected, then that is anathema to Christianity. It is the anathema. If you are in if you tolerate backbiting and backstabbing and ode to whelp, that type of stuff, and you're the leaders, you're just a whitewashed wall. I do not go where I can't trust. I do not go where I'm not respected. I do not go where I'm diminished. I do not go where I'm put down, gossiped about. I do not go where I am devalued. I do not go where I know they're scanning me, but they will not speak. They refuse to, to interact. I'm just being suspiciously scanned like a stereotype. That is, to me, degrading and so anti-Christ. It is demonic. It is demonic to do it. Spread this tape around, please. This is false teaching. If you do have a few people, you got to scan people a bit. But if you're loving, you will get over your fear and your bias, your big prejudice. You need to keep your cult going, and you'll act like a human, that these are real humans. Some people have a controlling issue, some don't, but you don't act like you're this big Pharisee, or what is it, a Roman patrician superior. You don't... I don't know what this is going on in the last many years. TV affected, it could be just micro it could be just mega ministries, and then micro ministries who think they're going to be the next mega ministry. I don't know what this is, but we got to get it. So it's either a choice. Here's the thing: when I just commented on that, it is huge. I didn't know I'd see it up here. I did. I didn't know I'd see it in Dallas, everywhere, a lot of places. I did. That's what got my red flag up to teach more than three times. Then I realized, well, what do people really want now in ministry? If you've got the call to ministry and be a Christian minister, what do you really want? you got to figure this out now before you package and market it. What do you really want? Do you really want to build a fellowship, a Christian ministry, a church? Do you really want to have a church or two churches? Or do you really want a cult following? Do you want a mega cult with two or three campuses of the mega cult? Do you want your following so that you are the high gimlet? Everybody has to do your bidding. They can't think. I mean, really, what is your choice? You're going to have to decide right now. This is going to be a mega. It is a mega move of God, but you've got to do it without the wealth, patricianism, without the respecter of persons, which diminishes and accuses those who are not in the in crowd. You've got to do this at a better, more biblical first church way before all this celebrity came in. You know, ironically, people have said through the years that the shepherd, the good shepherd, has the scent of sheep 
on their clothes. I've heard that said more than once. However, I don't picture Jesus hiding out with his in the fort, avoiding all the sheep because he didn't want to get his holy cassocks tainted, or he might be depleted by some of the weak, classless, and immature. Even though you got to have a boundary, you know, of like not being used or you know depleted in a wrong sense, but there should be a balance between family and Christian ministry and celebrity, and then. There is such a thing as renown. You can have renown. That's in Zephaniah, Zechariah. It's okay to have renown, be well known. But celebrity is the difference that Paul despises, comes out against in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1, chapters 1 and 3. He says, don't say I'm for a, pos for a famous bishop, Apollos. Don't say I'm just for a Paul. Just say you're for Christ, and this is what is lacking. Why? I've seen why, and I'll tell on it and teach on it the other day. Because it's the top people and the people that are their clones that like them, you know, that get them real fast, that are approved, will feel good about it. They'll feel it's healthy. But for the atypical non typecast, not their stereotype preferred, they are going to know a difference. They're, they're being disrespected, resisted. It is a spiritual thing. It's spiritual warfare for the Hebrews 1025 turf. It does not represent the balance of a real church. Let's put it that way. It does not, usually it's a racist gender bias thing. It really is. Or certain types of genders, certain types of people respecter of persons. So I've noticed it too often to tolerate it, to not address it, because the Lord said, if you see something three or more times and it hurts people or it hurts my good name, my safe name, then teach on it. That's why I teach. This is why I teach. So God is good. His mercy endures. His disciples, his Christians may not always be good and their mercy may not be existent. They may be tough. So you don't avoid Jesus and fellowshipping with the saints. You just window shop and you shop around till you get where you're supposed to. And if you can't find anybody, thank God for online ministry. <laughs> thank God for online ministry. Thank God because in Dallas, we started this ministry online as the online fellowship where we're going to try to have more fellowshipping opportunities, not just be, you know, rare, you know, we're trying to be more normal in a real fellowship sense once we get in our office in May. But I thought, you know, if you can't find any place you feel respected, it's so sad. It's so sad. If you feel you're being opposed, you're being lied to, you're being disrespected, demeaned, having bias, chauvinism against you time after time after time, which I've had which is not fun. And they've never been black and they've never been Baptist denominational. They look pretty sweet right now, frankly, <laughs> compared to all this legalism. Tough mindedness. So therefore, I'm going to say I am a prophet of prophets and I have a prophetic ministry that is not whelp, not charismatic. We are born again. Not and we are not spooky, not psychic, but we are cross body unity. Book of Ephesians 4 that means I can hang with people and deal with people and love people, whether they never speak in tongues or whether they do. It's really your heart, and we try to help people hear God and think young. That's all it is. But we're not going to be di what do you call it, demon spires, unless you are a demon <laughs> that will bind it. <laughs> But we need to keep our joy and our mirth. We want to have a lot of mirth, frankly, in these ministry. We are for people, God's people. We're just not for the respecter of person's spirit, which is a dreary, wanton, man-pleasing, but also a biased spirit. And we are not... In a, I think when we meet with many legalistic systems, micro to mega, it has money involved. The chief issue is love of money. So I've lived a testimony in my life where I have put God first with no money. <laughs> Yet God has provided. And we're, we're past that season. Also, when I tell people, I know I get really criticized 
and put down by prophets who think they know me but never speak to me. And I know these people are very proud <laughs> and that I came as a off scouring of the world to them. I'm just an off scouring of the world to the mega ministry like Paul was to the first 12. I'm you know, I'm just an off scouring the world, but that was a season. That was the last season. In the last few weeks, in the last month or two, the Lord has said, that time is over. Now you are to shine and you are to produce and you are to receive income. So I am now going to go to the next phase, but I'm watchful and very careful how I deal with money. As you know, that's why we're one reason we've been through our trial, because we are, we are very, very scared we don't want the, I'm not really afraid of it, but I don't want to make it look like we have the love of money, the lust of money. You know, we're trying not to. There is a balance, which I teach that it's your conscience. Prosperity is right here between your own ears and your conscience, not being holier than thou, not being um, fearful of being poor or rich, but having a non-materialistic, uh, a real approach of not being greed, but being whatever your idea of prosperity is, that's your deal, not mine. Mind your own business. But in the past few years, really, few, for a while, the Lord led me to do this, to do that, because I'm a first responder, I'm a missionary on the front lines, like a battlefield nurse, and I come from that. So nothing because I was looking for a home and the whelp spirit drove me out. It has driven me out. It has chased me out. It is, it is character. It has done horrible things. The nightmare of the ministry, the IFFM, the crossbody move of God relationship ministry has been the bias and the character assassination undermining of the Alexander, the coppersmith of this move. And they were not black. So we are dealing with that as a scriptural point of view, like Paul, just Paul, he named Alexander the coppersmith. I could name people in many states that have the same teaching, false teaching, because they were the same kind of person in their doctrine, will not relate, will not talk, one to, will not submit themselves to relationship respect, did not honor a mother in Christ, did not honor a person, a peer, a prophet, because they were biased. And legalistic, and I wasn't famous. That was another thing I noted. But you know what? Do I care? No, it only made me more joyful and more, more relaxed about being myself and knowing how it feels to have bias against you. I'd never had that much bias till I moved to Dallas. <laughs> and it was such a horrible spirit. It made me think this is how black people must feel. Oh, my stars. I'd never been around chauvinist misogyny in ministry. I'd never been around put downs because you're you're in a bunch of cults and, and they only think if you're famous in the white cults that you're worth being respected as a newbie, as a person. So it was a jail time, but I'm out of jail and I'm full of joy. You know, prophets go through pit times. And you may look pitiful, but you don't feel pitiful. You just know that this is part of the sifting. Pauline shipwrecks got a lot of sifting, humbling to do. And when I was in that type of hail fellow, well met Christianity circles down there, and also the we are well off and have need of nothing group, big group of that whole achievement group. We're well off, we know it all, and we're all wise, and we have need of nothing. It made me realize, made me weep for those that don't know Jesus, that are black and brown and maybe poor and humble, that would look for the Christ, the risen Christ, and couldn't see him for all the mayhem, all the misogyny, all the people-pleasing, all the lust for other things, all the ministry pomp and finery, all the hierarchy and caste system, all the tail-bearing and all the tongue-wagging and all the people-pleasing. I just don't think we could do that. So I pulled out, and I'm not a part of the systems. In fact, we're trying to get from the Lord how to have a giant ministry. I teach giant. But do it like you're the only person ever created by God, male or female. How to get other people to get this. You know, I can mentor. How to do this new move of God so it's not all white 
It's not all brown. It's not all male. It's not all female. It's whoever. We're not looking. You know, Jesus. we got to tell people Jesus wasn't a white person. He was Middle Eastern. When he was Middle I wrote back because it was so horrible in, in Charismatica in Dallas. When I was looking for the worship of the Lord. That's all I was looking for. The gym was nicer and more respectful and equal opportunity. And so I thought because of the Hispanics and the different people that were internationals, I felt for them and I thought, what if Jesus came to town? I wrote something on Tavo Leader. You know, I've written about Levitical patriotism going back to 2013, 12 on Tavo Leader and other places. So I've have a long history of many levels of studying from the Eli Temple I priest on, on up the roots of Levi. And I'll teach that later. But I thought, Wow, what if Jesus got off at the bus stop in downtown Dallas and he had brown skin, brown hair, looked like a Hispanic or Middle Eastern person. He got off with just two cardboard suitcases. He didn't look the part. He didn't look fine. He didn't have his entourage. He didn't have his business card. He had two suitcases. And what if Jesus got off the bus and started to walk because he had no vehicle. He got off the bus and he started to walk around town to see where he was supposed to go. And then he would meet these high and righteous Christians, mighty Christians, they know it all. I mean, really, they know it all. They've, you know, they know the word. They know the word. They know it's right. Yeah, they know it's right. They got it down. They got a CD to sell back then. And so I thought it over. I thought, how would Jesus feel if he comes to town today? How would Jesus come if he, how would he feel if he came to town in your part of town, in your country, in your city, in your urban area, in your suburban area, in your downtown Main Street area, how would he feel? Would he recognize what he came to save? <laughs> would he recognize his people? And would he have pet persons? Would he respect everybody or would he just respect a few crowd? Would it be a hail fellow well met Jesus? Would he be the Santa Claus Jesus? Would he be the famous Jesus? Would he be the mega church, mega cult Jesus? I don't know. Would it be the low-key Jesus? I don't know. I think it'd be down to earth, frankly. I think he'd be walking about. I think, and I you know, I have an itch in my eye. I'm not weepy, but almost weepy. But I think of my dad. I think of the unsung, silent servant leaders who have no fame, who are not rich, who may be poor. You know, in Virginia, before I went to Dallas, I was sent out to the Pentecostal campground because they had good worship. The glory... <laughs> And it was one of my lifesavers. I really honored that part. I went to Pentecostal, but I learned about it. And I started to understand because they would bring their emphasis not was not on their, their all their fancy stuff, but they would bring in people from the who witnessed on the front lines in India and Africa. They bring in the African missionaries from Africa and the Indian missionaries from India, and they would come for eight weeks and take care of them. Ruth Heflin. Uh, who had the glory move of God in worship. So I'd be out there and I start to understand how enjoyable it is not to care about what you look like so much. I love that. And then I enjoyed meeting the people, the multicultural people, and I saw the ones who were on the front lines of India. And I would meet the ones who were barely making it and they were put and they were poor, but they were working for the Lord on the front lines in far-flung places of India paying the price with no money. <laughs> one little pa one pastor <laughs> named Pastor Victor, we were friends in our family, uh, he was praying, for, he was an older man, and he was praying for a motorcycle to be able to get him through the woods or the jungle to where he was ministering. He was an older man. And so if he was having his faith for that, I mean, that touches my heart. That's where I live. That's what turns me on, I guess you'd say, for ministry. Basically, everyday people. So one of his stories was that he had to go, you know, he, sometimes he'd meet a tiger or something out there in the woods. And I went, oh my gosh. So we'd never know who we're ministering to online and who we'll minister to in the grassroots. That's what I like about it. One tale I remember from long ago, 20 years ago, 
I'd go to these, you know, for a while, for a season, I was sent there and I would learn about the move of the spirit. It was good. And so one time I met, you can meet all kinds of quality and some oddballs. So one time I was there and this, it was sort of a special gathering, like a conference. So I was out there and this man I met, this man, you know, average looking man, he says, I'm the Archangel Gabriel. I went, okay, it's the Archangel Gabriel's here today. So then I, you know, said goodbye and I walked on down. Well, this lady comes up, she says, have you seen my husband? I said, well, what does he look like? He says, well, he's the Archangel Gabriel. <laughs> I lit all my stars. But that was rare. <laughs> so you got to take it with a grain of salt. That's what I say. You got to not lose your humor. You got to just say, you know, odd is odd, but it didn't mean it's not God. You know, people, if they're there for the right reasons and they can't help but they were, you know, if they have issues, but we can, if we are, if we were raised right, if we are not having in, you know, challenges like that, if we really are true people that have a bit of a modest mentality, we should investigate and let God speak to us and reprove ourselves so that we do not believe the evil report, backstab, make Jesus' house untrustworthy, blaspheme Jesus' name. You know, the Bible, organically, if you want to find organic ministry and organic fellowship, organic, and I've got to go, Isaiah 56, verse 7, talks about the blessing, the commanded on blessing on anybody who follows, takes a day off or time out for a Sabbath apart with God from any nation, any stature, any size, you know, doesn't have to be famous or well off. Even the eunuch, it says, gets a blessing. So it says in Isaiah 56, verse 7, that the commanded, the fellowship to me is, I will make you joyful. Let's see. For those who commanded Sabbath, it says, I will, um, I will take you to my holy mountain. I'll make you joyful in my house of prayer. Your burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. And my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. Not just the good looking ones. Not just the well-taught seers, not just the black ones, not just the white ones, but all people. All right. That's a really organic view of Hebrews 10, 27. Study that. The other one would be for ministry. Anybody in a church, not a church, in a group, not a group, any Christian could model Isaiah 61. I believe it's, he has called me to, he sent me to teach the good news. That one. So we want to read through the eyes of non-legalism, eliminating toxic accusation, getting down to earth, relatable, easily entreated, James 3.17, that's our call for the hour and the day, and that's why I'm not going to be, I'm writing a line in the sand as the Lord said, I'm stepping out, coming out now, that time of whatever before is over, and I'm going to come out on land and build. And we're going to build plenty. And we're going to do it for the sake of Jesus, not to have a name for ourselves, not to do anything to hurt anybody or get even. This is about the Lord saying there is a sign today. I'm a sign to be a sign and a wonder. Ezekiel lay on his side for four years, 390 days, whatever it was, as a sign to the unbelievers, to the to the leaders of God's people to warn them. And I, Tavo DRC, have been a, I'm sent to you as a sign for what you are doing to many people, what you have been doing and you keep on doing, and you're about to come on under judgment. A few of you, I know a few of you are going to come under judgment. And I have seen that since 2000, I mean, really for years building, especially Dallas. And I have been sent to many of you, some of you, as an off-scouring to see how you treat and respect somebody who didn't have a name, didn't have an office that you knew about, that didn't have a title, that didn't have money, and that was a female, I guess, a female too. And you owe the Lord because you're doing it to a lot of people. And you've done it to a lot of people. So I am... Over that, 
we're over it, we're out of it, and we're not under it. And see, this is it. Charismatics, you think you're over me. <laughs> you think you want to, oh, that I'm sent to be under you. I am not under you. <laughs> That's why Brother B, out and about as a free spirit, fellowshipping where the Lord leads me, planting the work of the Lord, our own offices, trying to make a network and help many people in our area and online, and mentoring and training so that you can get it right. So you can really get it right. It's not about you. It's not about your cult. Not about your ministry. It's about the Lord. And that's what it is. God is good. His mercy endures. This is Tavo DRC signing off for now. If you need me to speak. If you need to address anything I said with a comment. If you are respectful. If you want to be mentored. Or just dialogue and pick apart doctrine. To see if it's back under the law. I'm open. Alright. God is good. Bye-bye.